Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome and happy International Women's Day. I'm Amy Bott, and on behalf of the Gender and Women's Studies core faculty, coordinating committee, and affiliate faculty, I'd like to welcome you to the 11th annual Kornman Lecture in Gender and Women's Studies. Through the Kornman Lecture Series, we seek to highlight the wealth of contemporary scholarship on gender and sexuality across the disciplines. The series is named for Dr. Joan Kornman, the founding director of Women's Studies here at UMBC, as well as the founding director of CWIT and Emeritus Professor of English. We wouldn't have such a vibrant intellectual community in the GWSC program, the English department, or the humanities in general without her leadership, so we are thankful for that. This year's lecture is co-sponsored by the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, the Office of the Provost, the Dresher Center for the Humanities, Student Life's Mosaic Center, the Women's Center, the Global Studies Program, the Media and Communication Studies Department, the Modern Languages, Linguistics, and Inter Intercultural Communications Department, the Africana Studies Department, the Asian Studies Program, and the American Studies Department. Um, I'd like to take a moment and recognize American Studies as their sponsorship was inadvertently left off of some of our promotional materials for the event, and we very much appreciate their support along with the rest of our co-sponsors. We're thrilled that today's talk is also part of the Dresher Center's Humanities Forum series. We have some other great events coming up, which you can check out at the Dresher Center's website, which is dreschercenter.umbc.edu. If you're on Twitter, please use tonight's hashtag, which is hashtag HUMforum18, so HUMforum18. I invite you also to attend the next Humanity For Humanities Forum event coming up on Wednesday, April 11th at 7 p.m. in the Performing Arts and Humanities Building, Room 132. As part of the Focus on Gentrification series, uh, Focus on Gentrification in Baltimore series, the Dresher Center will host author and Baltimore Sun photojournalist Amy Davis, who will be giving a talk entitled Flickering Treasures, Rediscovering Baltimore's Forgotten Movie Theaters. So in honor of International Women's Day, I'd like to reflect for a moment on the work that Gender and Women's Studies does here at UMBC, as well as our signature Women in Leadership and Learning program. We work to bring classes, programming, and workshops to campus that promote both social justice and feminist scholarship and activism. I encourage students to check out the flyers that we have for our fall courses uh, at the tables in the back, and also to check out our curriculum and extracurricular offerings on Facebook and Twitter as well. I'm pleased now to introduce you all to our speaker. Deepa Iyer is a racial and gender justice advocate, writer, and lawyer. An immigrant who moved here from Kentucky, from India when she was 12 years old, Deepa graduated from the University of Notre Dame Law School and Vanderbilt University. Currently, she is a senior fellow at Race Forward, a member of the Soros 2017 Equality Fellows Cohort, a contributing writer for Color Lines, and has written for other major publications such as the New York Times, The Nation, and The Guardian. Her first book, which is available here in the back for sale, um, is We Too Sing America, South Asian, Arab, Muslim, and Sikh Immigrants Shape Our Multiracial Future. She will be signing copies of this book as well at the end of the lecture, so please do check it out. This book received a 2016 American Book Award and was selected as a top 10 multicultural nonfiction book of 2015. She provides trainings on racial equality, uh, racial equity, and solidarity, and we were fortunate enough to have her lead two workshops yesterday for students and faculty on anti-racist and anti-Islamophobic activism and allyship. Previously, Deepa served for a decade as the executive director of South Asian Americans Leading Together. She's also worked as legal director at the Asian Pacific American Legal Resource Center, staff attorney at the Asian American Justice Center, and trial attorney at the Civil Rights Division of the United States Department of Justice where she fashioned an initiative to address post 9-11 backlash with two other attorneys. She's also taught classes on Asian American movements and South Asian American communities at a number of universities, including down the street at uh, University <laughs> of Maryland College Park. And in tonight's talk, titled Becoming Bridge Builders and Disruptors, Navigating Racial and Gender Realities in America Today, she'll explore the racial realities affecting people of color, women, immigrants, and refugees in America. So I invite you all to please um, stick around for the reception afterwards to also check out her book and uh, uh, take a minute to, to speak with Deepa as well. There are seats in the front for folks who are in the back. Um, I invite you also to, <laughs> to fill in the rows. There's lots of rooms here in the front. Um, and with that, please join me in welcoming Deepa Iyer. Good afternoon, everyone. One more time, with feeling. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. I know it's 4 o'clock. 
Um, I am so pleased to be here. I want to first thank Amy Bud, Professor Amy Bud. I so appreciate your collaborative spirit um, in lifting up another South Asian sister. And if you haven't already, please check out her groundbreaking new book on immigration that is coming out next month. Um, I also am so grateful to the Drescher Center, in particular Jessica Berman and Courtney Hobson, as well as the Gender and Women's Studies Department, in particular Amy, of course, Carol McMahon, and Ella Everhart, um, who made my visit to campus so enriching. It's been great to meet so many of the students and faculty here, and I hope that we get to do that um, at the reception, as Amy said, as well in the book signing. So thank you for being here. As Amy mentioned, and as everyone knows, today is International Women's Day. And on this day, I want to take a moment to really remind ourselves of the lessons we have to learn from our foremothers, our ancestors, our sisters, of the power of women who hold up so many institutions in our world, of the women who toil in our homes, in farms, in hotels, outside the spotlight of the women who are making their way with their children over oceans to find a better life, and of the women warriors who are organizing communities across the country for immigrant, gender, and racial justice. If you'll join me, let's take a moment to think about a woman who has made a difference in our lives and call her into our presence. Thank you, I can feel that the room has got bigger <laughs> and expanded. Um, so in the time that we have together, I'm going to be talking about the racial realities, specifically those that are facing South Asian, Muslim, Sikh, and Arab communities with an em emphasis on the impact on women. And I'll also be providing a framework for us as individuals and institutions to be disruptors and bridge builders to contend with what Dr. King called the fierce urgency of now, which is this particular moment that we are in. Okay, um, so the, the slide that you see up here, and I'm going to be using this PowerPoint, which has a lot of images in it, and I'll be moving through them quickly, um, but the slide that you, are, that you see here is really a reflection of some of the people, the young people actually, that appear in my book, um, Muslim, Sikh, Arab, and South Asian immigrants who have found themselves navigating the racial realities of post 9 11 America. But before I get to talking about them, I want to just give you a little bit about my own point of entry into racial justice movement work. So as Amy mentioned, I'm an immigrant. I moved, or my parents moved us, from the state of Kerala in India all the way to the state of Kentucky um, when I was 12, no less. So as you can imagine, it was um, a very confusing adolescence. And um, I obviously worked some of that out in college in terms of my sense of identity, my sense of belonging, what, who was I, um, in, an, in a state where really the racial binary was black or white. And I didn't really know where I was or where I fit in. Um, I certainly knew I was not white. Um, but I wasn't exactly clear where I belonged. And when I went to college and studied post-colonial literature and then later on went to law school, I started to work out some of these issues, but it really wasn't for me until um, September 11th and the days and months after that I experienced a significant turning point um, that enabled me to understand race and um, issues of justice through a lens that was about power. And I say that because at the time I was working at the Department of Justice as a civil rights attorney and experienced a process of double grieving on 9-11 and the days after. Grieving, of course, for the victims of those horrific attacks that had happened on our soil, but also grieving for communities who would be scapegoated for what had happened on that fateful day. The understanding that it was going to be communities that look like mine, um, families that look like mine, who would be scapegoated, led me to really question and interrogate how I could make a difference, how I could use some of the privileges I had. And it led me to um, an organization named SALT, South Asian Americans Leading Together, where I worked with many others on the front lines of events that occurred in the decade after 9-11. SALT is actually headquartered in Maryland, in the DC area, and remains an organization that continues to speak out on justice issues through an intersectional lens. So I learned a lot during that decade um, about building an organization, of course, but also about developing an analysis grounded in white supremacy and anti-black racism. I learned about my own privileges, internal biases, and blind spots. And of course, I learned about the impact of Islamophobia. 
that led me, those 10 years, led me to writing We Too Sing America, which I hope provides a more complete narrative about the lives of South Asian, Arab, Muslim, and Sikh immigrants. Because the narratives that we often hear and learn and study about 9-11 and the impact afterwards is either sanitized or incomplete and doesn't really center the communities that have been most affected. So my book posits that there are three forces that came together in the decade and a half after 9-11 to create a climate of fear and danger for our communities. And those three forces are Islamophobia, xenophobia, and racial anxiety. And my book also foreshadows um, what has been happening in the last year and a half in our country as well, that the post 9-11 environment really set up and set a ground, uh, a kind of a, a breeding ground for some of the anti-refugee and anti-immigrant sentiments that we are dealing with and confronting today from the highest levels of government to state and local communities. So just a really quick, um, I guess, summary to start talking about Islamophobia first. Um, so Islamophobia is, is really a set of narratives and policies that are premised on the belief that Muslims and those who are perceived to be Muslims are national security threats. And so because of that, Islamophobia has led to a wave of different narratives and actions and policies in this country that are all premised on this sense of danger coming from Muslims and those perceived to be Muslims. And when I say those perceived to be Muslims, I'm speaking of folks who are Arab, Sikh, Hindu, South Asian, really brown folks overall. So what does Islamophobia look like? How has it actually manifested itself over the last decade and a half since 9-11? Well, it looks like threats to the safe places of worship that many of our parents, our first generation immigrants, created and built in their communities after they moved here. It also looks like hate violence. Um, this is a picture of Sunando Sen, who was killed in 2012, a Hindu immigrant um, killed in New York City, pushed in front of a subway by someone who said that they were taking revenge for what happened on 9-11, and it happened in 2012. You might recall seeing the news about these three young Palestinian American students who were killed in North Carolina. And you may not have heard, um, because it didn't make the news, about a threat, a series of threats made by an individual against a black Muslim community in a town called Islamburg in New York City. It's not just hate violence that our communities are enduring, it is also school-based bullying. We know, for example, that sick American children who sometimes wear turbans and have long hair are often bullied at twice the national rate. And the same goes for Muslim women and girls who wear the hijab. This is from a report in California by the Council on American Islamic Relations. Beyond the school environment, when we look at employment and places of work, we continue to see that women, in particular Muslim women, are told that they cannot wear the hijab, are told that they don't actually have the look to be in particular forward-facing or public-facing positions. Um, this is an example of um, a campaign by Care Maryland called Constitutionally Covered, and obviously talking about the hijab being a, uh, a way that people can appear that is absolutely constitutional in the workplace. Beyond our classrooms, beyond the workplace, we're also seeing profiling happen in different um, ways targeting our communities. Airport profiling, I'm sure, is one that everyone in this room has heard of. This is a picture of Waris Alawalia, who's a Sikh American actor who was barred from boarding a plane because of his, quote, suspicious appearance. And lastly, beyond one-on-one -on -one violence or discrimination or um, institutional discrimination, one of the most pernicious ways in which Islamophobia has been working itself out is actually through the state through government policies that surveil, monitor, detain, and deport our community members. In many cases, leaving behind women, because the target is usually men or young men, leaving behind women who have to all of a sudden be the financial breadwinners and the caregivers to their families in the United States. So these are just examples of the surveillance that we've seen, for example, in New York City, 
where the NYPD has been monitoring or used to monitor, um, there have been some, um, there have been obviously some litigation about this, um, used to monitor mosques, Muslim students associations, and other schools, and even public parks in Brooklyn and Queens where South Asians and Arab families were playing cricket and soccer because they were seen as potentially suspicious. Now beyond Islamophobia, which is one of the legs or the circles that I had alluded to earlier, what we've also seen is anti-immigrant sentiment or xenophobia play itself out over the past decade and a half since 9-11. So that includes, and as, as, as you will remember, um, policies such as not accepting Syrian refugees, but it also includes a lot of anti-immigrant laws that have been introduced in legislatures around the country um, including English-only laws, anti-Sharia laws, and other anti-refugee laws that are targeting these communities in particular. And then the third um, force or phenomena that has come together is racial anxiety. And racial anxiety is really the backlash that people are having to the changing composition, the changing demographics of our country. As this chart shows, as we are moving towards 2030, in fact, by the time we get to 2042, our country will be one in which people of color make up the majority population in the United States for the first time in our history. That sounds really great for, I think, most of us in this room, all of us in this room, um, and really begs the question of power, equity, access, right? Um, but it has also stirred up a lot of backlash where people use, are, are concerned that the true nature of America is being corrupted, is being changed, is being diminished, and that there are benefits and resources that folks are not getting as a result of these demographic changes, which are again, mythical and made up viewpoints. But they're leading to um, the sorts of messages like these that we have come to see time and again. Build a wall, ban Muslims and refugees, um, English is America's first and official language. Um, these sorts of sentiments that really make people feel that they don't belong in the United States. So all of this has been happening for some time. Um, and it has been really concentrated on Arab, Muslim, South Asian, and Sikh immigrants. So for many of us, it wasn't a huge surprise, right, when we have seen more of the recent attacks on our communities. But before we get there, I actually wanted to take a moment um, to read a, a part of my book, a couple of passages from my book. In many cases, um, people will say that it is the brown man who has been the target of Islamophobia, but I would argue that the rights and bodies and livelihoods of women have been at stake as well. And I want to start, um, I want to kind of flesh that out a little bit by telling you the story of a Sikh American woman named Parminder Kaur. And I'll read a couple of passages about Perminder so you can get a sense of who she was. It was early on a Sunday morning in August of 2012, and Paramjit Kaur Saini was going about her morning routine. Her sons, 20-year-old Kamal and 18-year-old Harpreet, wanted to sleep in a little bit longer. So Paramjit set out on her own to the local Gurdwara, the Sikh temple of Wisconsin. She was a familiar presence there. The Gurdwara had become a second home to her family and to many other Sikhs in Oak Creek, which is a small city located in the outskirts of Milwaukee. The Gurdwara, built in 2007 on 13 acres of land by Sikh immigrant families, sits just a few miles from the Milwaukee airport. On weekends, Sikh families gathered at the Gurdwara to pray and connect with one another. The dining hall was filled with the sounds of people socializing and children laughing during langar, which is a free meal offered to anyone who came to the Gurdwara. Kamal and Harpreet usually hung out with their friends and played football on Sundays, while their mother helped in the kitchen and the prayer hall. But August 5, 2012 would not turn out to be a normal Sunday for Paramjit's family or for the Oak Creek community. Soon after his mother had left the house, news reached Kamal that people inside the Sikh temple of Wisconsin were in danger. Details were scarce and panic-stricken, Kamal rushed to the Gurdwara to find that law enforcement vehicles had blocked off the driveway. Authorities asked Kamal to wait across the street in the parking lot of a bowling alley where he joined others also anxiously searching for information. While waiting there, 
Kamala and others speculated about what might be happening inside the Gurdwara. They wondered, did a dispute between community members go awry? Then, Kamal's close friend, Kirandeep, received a call from her father. He was inside the Gurdwara. He whispered to her that he was hiding in the pantry of the kitchen because he had heard gunshots. He was one of around 25 people huddled, terrified, among bags of rice and fresh vegetables. Kirandeep's father told her not to come to the Gurdwara under any circumstances. As the day wore on, many of the people who had been inside were allowed to leave, and a fuller picture began to emerge about the rampage that had occurred inside the Gurdwara that Sunday morning. Not seeing his mother and becoming increasingly anxious about her safety, Kamal left the parking lot. He called his friends, and together they went from hospital to hospital, hoping that Paranjit had been brought to one. It would be a full 11 hours before authorities finally notified Kamal that his mother had been one of six people fatally shot inside the Gurdwara. When I first found out, I passed out, Kamal told me. I woke up in an ambulance and immediately thought of my little brother. Telling him was the hardest thing I've ever done. This was not the future that Paramjit had envisioned for her family when she and her two sons moved to America from India in 2004 to join her husband who owned a number of gas stations in Wisconsin. And it was not the life that Paramjit had planned to build when she mustered up the courage a few years later to begin working for a medical factory in a nearby town. She used to be a housewife for a few years after we moved here because she had a problem with English, Kamal remembered. But it's funny how she got the job because she had to do a phone interview. She was so afraid that they would call while we were in school and she wouldn't understand what they were saying. But it happened to be that the day she got the call, I was home and she put it on speaker and they kept asking her questions and I kept translating for her, Kamal told me. With his assistance, Paramjit passed the interview handily and started her job at the medical factory. Paramjit's determination to care for her family is a point of deep pride for Kamal and her priest. 45 days after his mother was killed, Harpreet spoke about her in testimony before the United States Senate. He said, My mother was a brilliant woman, a reasonable woman. Everyone knew she was smart, but she never had the chance to get a formal education. She couldn't. As a hardworking immigrant, she had to work long hours to feed her family, to get her sons educated, and to help us achieve our American dreams. This was more important to her than anything else. But now she's gone because of a man who hated her because she wasn't his color or his religion. She was an American, but this was not our American dream. So I'm going to pause there and just take a minute of silence to remember um, Paranjit and all the victims of hate and gun violence in Oak Creek and around the country. Thank you. Um, so the rest of the chapter uh, talks about what happened in that community of Oak Creek, Wisconsin, after this massacre occurred, how authorities found out that um, the person who had actually committed the massacre was a man who had ties to white supremacist organizations, and how the community really responded. A community in, um, I would say, not a rural part of America, but a part of America that's very small town and with very little diversity, how they actually came together, how they actually came together to not, just, not only forgive the perpetrator who had committed this crime, but to also deal with the impact, the psychological impact on the victims and the community as well. And the rest of the book continues in that way to talk about um, the post 9-11 generation and the impact of living in post 9-11 America, the continued impact on this generation. And here are just some of the ways in which our communities continue to be affected. Um, there is obviously the psychological impact of being othered, but there's also a lot of self-editing that often happens in our communities, where there are questions that people would normally not ask about mundane um, events or activities, such as, should I go to my Gurdwara today? Or should I wear my hijab? Um, should I speak to my parents in our native language if we're out in public? 
right? These are the types of questions that people are asking themselves from these communities because we have to. Um, there has been also isolation and invisibility. And of course, this has led to disparities and inequities in our communities. This, this sort of post 9-11 environment has led to many um, <coughs> financial, housing, and other disparities and inequities that continue to be studied. So um, as I was saying earlier, since the election, we have unfortunately only seen the exacerbation of the factors and elements that um, make up post 9-11 America. And the reason for this is that all of a sudden what was under the shadow and what was under the radar became visible. Not just became visible, but became emboldened as well because of the rhetoric and because of the narratives that have been created and the policies that are being implemented by this current administration. So this is, an, this is a chart from the Southern Poverty Law Center, which looks at the number of post-election hate incidents, I think that happened within a week or two right after the election, um, including a, an Indian American engineer by the name of Srinivas Kuchabotla, who was killed um, about a year ago in Kansas by someone who was spouting anti-immigrant views at a restaurant. This is his family and friends at a vigil for him. In addition to hate violence, we're also seeing, as you know, an increase in raids and detentions and deportations, whether it's at the border or whether it's at the interior of the country. We have seen the rescission of the DACA program that is, um, has put immigrant youth who have DACA status in a tremendous risk. And we've obviously seen um, policies like the Muslim and the refugee ban, which have continued to send this message that some people are not welcome in this country, that they should not be here in this country, and is continuing to tear families apart and destroy people's livelihoods as well. So that's a lot, <laughs> right? And, and I think that all of us have a sense of um, exhaustion at some level. I know I do. When I read the news or think about the communities that I'm close to and what they're enduring. And oftentimes I think about, and I'm inspired by this quote by Dr. King, um, where he talks about the fierce urgency of now. Um, and he says that we are confronted with it. I mean, he said this, of course, in the 60s, but I think it's very relevant today. And he says, in this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late, right? Um, too late to act, too late to speak up. And that is something that I think is so important for all of us in terms of a call to action. I'm an activist, so I always have a call to action um, of the importance of actually centering um, a framework that is all about equity, solidarity, inclusion, and justice in order to be bridge builders and disruptors in today's environment and to really look ahead to the America that we want to be creating as we head into that time of tremendous demographic transformation. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of these pillars, um, not all of them, but I think that um, the, one of the key ones that I think everyone in this room is very clear about is that as we think about um, a, a different type of race talk or race practice, it's so important to move from a race only approach to a race plus approach, right? So to think about how folks are carrying multiple sets of identities and as a result are experiencing oppression or discrimination at multiple lines. So whether that is class, whether that is around, this is a picture um, they see in queer, so whether it's about queer and trans identities or whether it is about um, being black and Muslim in this case being black and Muslim means sometimes being create, erased from conversations on Islam and blackness, but always belonging to both, says this particular picture. And so understanding that we can't actually have one lens through which we look at um, discrimination, that we really need to understand as our country becomes more multiracial and more diverse, that we need to look at the ways in which multiple systems are discriminating against people based on their multiple identities. Another sort of part of the framework is that we need to move beyond ignoring historic and contemporary inequities. And I know I don't have to say that to a lot of folks who are academics and historians, um, but you know, really understanding the importance of acknowledging multi-generational effects of trauma um, and especially racial trauma. And um, that means actually looking to indigenous movements to learn. It also means understanding that um, we have to shift our thinking from 
being in that black or white binary when it comes to race that I had spoken about earlier when I grew up in the 1980s in Kentucky, um, to thinking about how communities of color can come together, but at the same time centering anti-black racism. And I think that that has to be a cornerstone of our analysis in order to be bridge builders and disruptors, that that has to be the way that we start and where we begin. Um, and that's one of the things that I talk about often, especially with communities of, that are my own, South Asian communities or Asian American communities, because it is so important to understand that um, white supremacy and anti-black racism and indigenous genocide, colonialism, right, are connected and that they lead to the types of oppression that we see today that are targeting, say, South Asian Arab and Muslim communities. We also have to um, stop replicating divisions within our communities and actually uplift the connections between our communities. This is the pillar on solidarity practice and what makes for effective trans transformative solidarity practice. Um, one example of this is, um, I'm sure that you are very familiar with the model minority myth or the narrative that is often hoisted upon Asian American communities that they're well-educated and resourceful and have great jobs but this particular myth is one that replicates division between communities, both internally and externally. Internally, because not all Asian Americans actually have access to the types of um, benefits and services and education that lead to them getting certain jobs or achieving a higher level of education, but also um, externally, because the model minority myth is just a racial wedge that pits Asian Americans against black communities in particular. So one of the disruptions that I'm really grateful for is this one, where um, Asian Americans around the country are committing what is called model minority mutiny and claiming that we choose resistance and black lives matter, right? That we understand how we are often used as the racial wedge, but we refuse to actually engage in that. And we will also be addressing how anti-black racism plays itself out within our communities as well. And um, lastly, moving from this sort of narrative of diversity and multiculturalism, which is how I think we often have dealt with a lot of issues surrounding racism and race relations, especially on campuses or within corporations or even government agencies, where we, we start with diversity and we want to have a diverse classroom, right? Um, but really understanding that that is just a starting point and then moving towards equity and inclusion and justice is critical. And I know that most of you have seen some variation of this slide. I really love this one. It's from the Center for Story-Based Strategy and the Interactive in Interaction Institute for Social Change um, and an artist, um, Angus McGuire. Um, but I love this variation of that equity um, uh, graphic that you've probably seen because I think it adds a couple of different elements, right? It adds a fence which represents the multi-generational trauma and the systemic racism that actually prevents anyone from anyone, right? Even if they have a box from seeing the baseball game. But it also shows us that when we look from equality to equity, that rearranging the boxes, not adding any necessarily, but rearranging them allows everyone to appreciate the game. But most importantly, that liberation comes when we remove the fence entirely. Right, and that nobody actually then needs a box to sit on. And so really thinking about or reframing our thinking from diversity, oh, we've got lots of people of color in a particular classroom, right, um, which is the starting point, but then asking what are our equity benchmarks? How do we evaluate equity and access? And of course, a liberation frame um, is a way to move us along in terms of addressing the racial realities of the 21st century. Um, and then the, the last one um, is moving from being a bystander or an ally to being a co-conspirator. And, and I know that there's a lot of talk around allyship, and I would really challenge us to move beyond that concept. Um, and I especially say this, I think, about white folks, because I think white folks tend to think of themselves as allies when it comes to racial injustice. But I would challenge and invite white folks to actually be co-conspirators. Because it isn't just about um, sitting by or waiting for instruction, right? It's from people of color. It's about actually having a stake in the outcome and having some ability to affect institutions and people and families and networks that white folks are also um, part of. 
And I think that we need to move from that idea of a bystander or an ally to really think of co-conspirators, as these folks have, South Asians for black lives, which I think comes from Washington State. <laughs> Um, so I think the last couple of slides I have are just really quickly some best practices. Um, when I've kind of gone around the country and talked to people, these are some of the ideas that people call back out, right, or tell me that they have done in terms of um, dealing with the racial realities in, on their campus or in their community or in the country. So whether it is about having the difficult conversation with family members about anti-blackness or Islamophobia, whether it is about campus organizations um, taking part in solidarity efforts, um, or whether it is about asking administrators and institutional leadership to create safe spaces on campus. These are all ways that we can consistently and frequently take a stand in terms of being disruptors and bridge builders from our family to our networks to, of course, people in power in whatever entity that we are in. Because after all, um, I truly believe that social change movements are the key to creating change in our country and in our world. And so many of those have been led by people of color and they've been led by women. So whether it is um, the effort for, by Asian Americans to create Asian American studies programs around the country in the 60s, or calling for justice for hate violence victims led by women like Helen Zia in Detroit, or whether it is young Asian Americans claiming defiantly that we are not your model minority, or whether it's working class women standing up for better wages, for sanctuary, for the rights of domestic workers, putting themselves out there to say we deserve rights and we deserve equal pay and better treatment whether it is about people on, women on college campuses saying that they're against white supremacy, black women who are um, along with um, queer and trans communities leading the way in the movement for black lives, women like Tarana Burke um, and the Me Too movement, women who are South Asian who are continuing to push for an end to the Muslim and refugee bans, um, women like Graysa Martinez, who is an undocumented young person who is at the center of the fight for DACA, and people coming together to protest the Muslim ban all over the country. So these are the images and these are the stories that inspire me, that keep me kind of going as we think about the environment that we're in, as we have the perspective to look back at um, the post 9 11 environment over the past decade and a half. Social movements led by people who are directly affected, who are led by women, have shown us the way historically and today. Um, and lastly, just a uh, quote by one of the, I think, most inspiring uh, women, Grace Lee Boggs um, from Michigan, who continues and continued throughout her life um, to inspire so many of us. So I want to end, actually, by um, reading a quick poem by a, a poet named Shailja Patel, um, who's the author of Migritude, and it kind of harkens back to this idea of women um, and International Women's Day. And she wrote, actually this morning, um, read women, cite women, credit women, teach women, publish women, present women, acknowledge women, award women, amplify women. Hire women, support women, promote women. Hear women, believe women, follow women, pay women. Thank you so much for being here. And I look forward to a Q&A, because I think we have time before the reception, although I don't want to keep you from the food. Um, but I'm really looking forward to questions or feedback, and um, of course, um, meeting you all and the book signing as well. So thank you. Hijab back to show the hair, that sort of thing? 
Yeah, so what Muslim girls and women have reported happening, um, both in classrooms but also even in um, work environments or on the street, is that oftentimes people will touch their hijab, which one is not supposed to, to just kind of randomly touch someone's hijab, um, or even remove it um, and tug it off. And so um, that's, that's why um, it's been framed as offensive touching or the complete removal or pull off. Yes, sorry, can see you. Hi. Uh, so, um, uh, when you're talking about multiculturalism, you said that it will bring power. You mentioned it. Uh, can you just explain it more because I don't really understand how it's related. Yeah, so it's actually a question. Will it bring power more so than, than it is assumed to bring power? So I think that uh, many people say that when we have more communities of color in positions of influence, right? Um, say, for example, um, if we have more um, communities of color in our state legislatures or in elected official positions, that there is this feeling that communities of color are doing well that they've ascended to high levels of influence in different sectors. But the question that I think we need to ask is, is that really true, right? Um, because we can look and say there are a lot of people in certain positions, but does that really reflect um, power or equity? So uh, one question could be, um, how are those elected officials actually being treated in their positions? Um, what is, are they hitting a glass ceiling? How are they getting paid? What are they getting paid? Another question is, um, the communities that they represent might not actually be at a place where there is equity. So we know that um, when you look at every single indicator of success in this country, that many communities of color are lagging behind. So just because there are greater numbers or more presence or more influence doesn't mean that those basic inequities have been dealt with, right? So whether it's around um, educational access, access to housing, access to clean water, um, access to jobs, all of these things, when you look at those indicators, we realize that communities of color have fallen behind or are lagging for particular systemic reasons. Um, so part of um, understanding that the demographics are shifting is to not give in to this false idea that the more people you have, you have power, but to really target and understand how to eliminate those disparities. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Oh, quick, quick reminder. I, I didn't get all the words you mentioned on the what seat each diagram, equity. Oh, the pillar? Yeah, so equity, justice, solidarity, and inclusion. Equity, justice, solidarity, and inclusion. Yeah. Um, Deepa, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your process of um, writing a book like this. Um, you have this legal background, you have this activist background. Uh, what was it like to transition to amplifying stories in this format? How did you decide who to talk mm -hmm. to? What was, if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, so I went um, through that process by basically looking at the people that I had gotten close to over my time at SALT and um, understanding that their stories needed to be shared because they actually either were not shared in the past um, or weren't fleshed out fully enough. Um, so Kamal, the person that I read about who lost his mother, is someone that I had met when I went to Oak Creek, um, Wisconsin after the massacre and um, got to know him over a number of years. Um, uh, Drust is um, a young uh, refugee uh, Muslim woman in Tennessee whom I'd gotten to know. So it was really focused on and centered on those stories of individuals um, who um, are young people for the most part, you know, coming of age in this post 9-11 America and um, wanting to center their stories and then wrapping that around, right, with policy recommendations, with some sort of historic analysis um, to place those stories in context and provide some solutions and actions for folks to take as well. Um, so my, my real process was centering narrative and story of people that I actually care about deeply and then wrapping that around with the policy recommendations and calls to action. Yes? Would you say that was your method of going about your research? 
Yeah, it was. Um, I think that I, you know, I, for example, the first chapter is on hate violence, right? And so it starts with the story of um, the Oak Creek Massacre in Kummel. Um, but in it, I also um, talk about the history of hate violence that has been targeting South Asians in the United States. So going back to you know, like 1907 and the raids in Bellingham, Washington, for example, and then looking at um, the dot busters in New Jersey and other types of attacks that have occurred and how they have shifted in the post 9-11 context. Um, so um, centering the narrative, but then taking a step back to look at the historical context um, and then, of course, providing and really critiquing at some level some of the policies that have been put into place. So asking questions like, um, is uh, our, hate, um, our hate crimes laws um, the only way to go? Um, is there restorative justice in this particular context or not? Um, and beyond hate crimes laws, what are other ways in which we can actually um, address and eliminate hate violence in this country? Does that make sense? Yes. Um, Go ahead. I, I, we talked yesterday a little bit about this. Um, Cross-group solidarity is one of the big themes in your book and in your talk. And um, I, I, I think it's wonderful, but I think it's also very difficult, mm -hmm. right? And I'm wondering if you can um, talk to us a little bit about how that gets started, how you might overcome difficulties towards cross-group solidarity. And I'm also wondering what the role of stories might be in yeah. doing that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, multiracial solidarity, cross-group solidarity is an absolute messy process. And I think one has to just give in to that, you know, and, and accept that it is. And it is also a long-term process. Um, and I think that it, some of the ways that I have learned from others who do this very well, um, organizers, especially around the country, who are working in multiracial communities and what they have been sharing, um, is that it's really important to actually understand each other's stories. I think there's an assumption that we know each other's stories, our histories, our oppressions, our resistance stories, but we actually don't know as much as we think we do, right? And so the importance, as you said, of sharing story, of um, story talk, is um, really, really important to come together. Um, the other piece is that um, a lot of organizers say that it's important to have affinity spaces for communities before they enter sort of a multiracial space. So um, having a space that is only um, Arab or only South Asian or only Asian American, right, or only white is important because um, it allows people to actually talk through some of these kinds of um, thorny issues. Um, for example, um, what are anti-black perceptions that um, a particular community might hold? To work that out in space with people who are more like you is helpful before entering sort of a multiracial space because otherwise there's too many things that come up. So there's a process to it, um, but storytelling is key. And then the last thing I would say is to practice it over and over and over again, showing up over and over and again, but showing up in different ways. It might not be just showing up at a rally with a sign. It might be disrupting someone's comment, right? Around a particular community that you hear that your friend utters or your family set member says. So there are different ways to practice it, but it has to be practiced a thousand times over um, for people to feel comfortable with it, that it becomes sort of a natural thing to do. Um, so I have a website called solidarityis.org org, where I actually have some case studies and some principles that I've gleaned from talking to people who do this very well um, and, and really lifting up their stories. And I also do a monthly podcast on solidarity practice, which is available on iTunes under my name if you're interested in that, where I interview people um, who are thinking about this and, and talking about the messiness of it as well as the process. You had a question, and then I got you as well. Yeah. Um, could you just elaborate a little more on the difference between ally and co-conspirator? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So I think that oftentimes allyship, especially as it relates to white folks in particular, is is often said to be um, be a helper, right? Don't get involved. Don't center yourself. Take guidance from those around you, particularly communities of color. And I actually think that's extremely important. But I think that oftentimes what's left out is the importance of white folks also understanding what their stake is in dealing with systemic racism that affects their neighborhoods or their communities or their schools. So it isn't just about kind of helping on the side or taking guidance. It's about asking, well, what can I be doing 
right, to, to um, affect the outcome. Is for, so to be a co-conspirator could be to say, well, I'm gonna talk to um, other white people about these issues. Because a lot of times people of color are asked to kind of bear the burden of you know, dealing with systemic racism, dealing with the trauma that it inflicts on our own lives, and dealing with talking to um, white folks about it, right, and training them or talking to them about it. So I think that what is important is that white folks realize, and I think a lot of white folks realize this, that they have a role to play that's just as important, um, that they should still center um, people of color who are organizing, advocating, or telling their stories in actions, for example, right? But that they have a role to play perhaps in talking to their own communities, their families. They have a role to play in opening up institutions of power that they have access to and opening the door and letting other people in, right? They have a role to play in sometimes speaking truth to power, um, uh, especially to um, you know, people who are powerful who will not listen to people of color at all, who will just dismiss them outright. So that's what I mean about a co-conspirator approach. It's not a new thing that I made up, so it's like kind of out there. Um, but it's, it's a way for folks to actually ask themselves, what is my stake? What is my privilege? And what are the actual um, you know, steps that I can be taking as well to effect change? Yeah, so you know, generally speaking, when it comes to hate crimes laws, and most states, I think all states have a hate crime law, and we have a federal hate crime law, um, what it ends up happening is that after a person has um, committed a particular <laughs> crime, if it is a hate crime, so if you look at Dylan Roof in South Carolina, um, who committed murder, right, which is also a hate crime, because it wasn't targeting just one person, it was targeting black folks. So it was sending a message to black folks in that community and across the country that um, oftentimes these laws will add a, um, an additional amount of sentencing um, because it is a hate crime. So it's murder plus an extra number of years um, because it is seen as a hate crime. So that's usually been the way that the legal system has dealt with it and a lot of community advocates have supported that as well because of the importance of sending a message. So some of the, the questions that folks have been asking is, um, is that really restorative justice, right? And when I say restorative justice, I mean that you move away from a punitive and disciplinary model and you actually start from a rehabilitative model, right? How do we actually bring people in instead of um, just continue to push them away? How do we stop adding to and um, the incarceration complex that exists in this country in the first place? And so some of the alternatives have been, um, for example, uh, communities that have said that instead of sentencing this hate crime perpetrator to an additional five years in prison, we would like them to do community service at our place of worship or we would like them to come in and be in dialogue with us for a certain number of years. Or we would like them to go out and train their own community on, um, you know, that I think has happened in some cases with mosques who have said, we'd like to train this person on understanding what Islam is so that they can go out and do that with other communities that they're connected to. So those are just some examples. Um, I do think it's still important that we have anti-bias laws and anti-hate laws in this country because it's important to also have a preemptive uh, measure in hand under the law. Um, but at the same time, I think these other alternatives are also emerging because otherwise um, the hate is still there, right? You're not really, uh, you can't uh, incarcerate the hate out of someone if they have that sort of viewpoint or sentiment towards a certain group of people and they're not necessarily going to take it on to learn about those people or communities. Yeah, I know that's that's like one of those those ones that um, is is a hard to like unravel. But maybe I can just use an example. Um, so a lot of times, um, you know, we talk about the importance of diversity in a classroom, right? That we want diverse p students of color in classrooms, and we do. We want them from you know uh, whatever diversity we're talking about, race or ethnicity, immigration status, class, right? Uh, because those experiences really benefit the classroom as a whole. Um, but the question that, that I'm asking is, can we also ask the second question, which is around equity, which means that even if you have a diverse group of students in a classroom, 
that doesn't mean that everyone's getting the same level of or access to education, uh, job training, um, vocational advice, right? And so what are, in that particular classroom, what are the equity benchmarks? So one equity benchmark could be, we want everyone in this classroom to graduate on to the next level. And we're going to evaluate that to see how these children or students are doing from quarter to quarter, right? Um, and then we're gonna look at whether communities of color or students of color need um, additional services or benefits. Remember that box, right? Um, that they would need in order to be able to meet the benchmark of graduation. So equity actually for an equity analysis gets us beyond diversity, right? Beyond saying this is a great photo op, right? Um, that we have so much diversity in our classroom to actually making sure that everyone has equal access and equal um, ability to move on to whatever their next step is. Does that help to make sense? Thank you. Yes. Um, earlier you mentioned that in your book you discussed some policy recommendations. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, <laughs> so there are many, <laughs> but I'm trying to think of a couple of, of ones. Um, so, so my book really looks at um, the national security infrastructure that was created in this country in the wake of 9-11. Um, so it looks at how uh, the government, um, right after 9-11, put into place a lot of different policies and regulations that were focused on targeting people from particular countries of origin, right? Um, and for the first time, the government also started to use immigration as a tool to target communities as well through a national security lens. So what you had was a program in 2002 called Special Registration, which is really the antecedent, if you ask me, to the Muslim ban, um, which was basically a policy that said if you are a male who is 16 years or older from these 28 countries and it named those countries, then you had to, quote, register with immigration authorities because the U.S. government said, you know, we want to know where these immigrants live. Right? Um, so these were non-immigrants, people who were, who were on temporary visas who had to report. Um, that ended up basically um, uh, ended up in the deportation of thousands of immigrants from these countries, but not for any national security reason. Right? So that's one example of um, a, a type of program that was put into place. So one big policy recommendation that I have in the book is that we should not be implementing laws that racially or ethnically or religiously profile communities. Right, so we, we, that, is, that that's unconstitutional. Um, so whether it's that sort of registry program or whether it is the FBI um, deciding to spy or the NYPD deciding to spy on communities just because they happen to be Muslim or South Asian or Arab, um, those are all examples of racial profiling tactics that have been used against our communities and which will be used against other communities in the future. So that's one of the biggest policy recommendations in the book, um, that we need to, to move away from that, and that um, we need to actually look at other ways in which to uh, utilize national security purposes, like individualized suspicion, and more effective, smarter police tactics, enforcement tactics, rather than casting a wide net over everyone. Okay. <laughs> Seeing no hands. <laughs> Thank you. I really enjoyed the conversation and I hope to meet you all.